the click. It's um, a big honor being here uh, speaking to you. How many people have a HoloLens in this audience? Yeah, way more than my usual speech. Um, for those who don't know what I've been doing for the last year and a half, I've been traveling the world with Shell and, and doing a lot of speeches. Last week I was in Boston speaking to a bunch of uh, CTOs about you. And so I don't need to cover what you guys are doing all that much because I ho hope you understand what a AR is at a pretty deep level since you're building it. But I, I, I did want to uh, show you sort of the speech I usually give to the other people and then talk about where I think this industry is going. Clearly, this industry is getting bigger because last year it wasn't as big as this. And so there's more people in the tent than were here last year. Um, and in all the conversations, we keep talking about when is the consumer product coming that's going to get us excited by this industry that we're building. And I wish I had a great answer to that. Um, hopefully, Apple gives us a hint between now and the end of September what it's doing. Uh, Alex Kipman at, at Microsoft has a whole lab full of toys ready to ship. Uh, it, it we're in development, and they're looking pretty cool. Magic Leap, I hear is, the rumor is they're going to come out this year with a developer preview with a bunch of cameras around the glass. So that tells you a little bit about how they're going and how it might be different from a three-ounce pair of glasses from Apple or whatnot. Um, Shell and I wrote the book, Fourth Transformation, which the speech really started, I think, in 2006. I toured Stanford, and a, a guy showed me a camera that he designed for DARPA to take pictures through bushes. Anybody know who that camera company is? Lytro, right? And now Lytro is building light field cameras to capture uh, performers in not just that, but the actual angles of light coming off of that, which makes sense going all the way back to its history, where it tried to take pictures of light coming through a bush and computationally uh, join those pieces of light together into a single image. Um, and 2011, I went to Mateo in Germany, and they showed me monsters on the sides of skyscrapers, and Apple bought them. In uh, 2013, I think it was, uh, Prime Sense showed me a sensor that, well, when he showed it to me, it was uh, up here, aimed at a table, and it could tell how hard I was pressing on the table. That was four years ago. So... What does it do in September? We're going to find out. I usually start out and talk about uh, the future of television because when you, you guys know this, when you, when you get mixed reality glasses, you get as many screens as you want. You, we're going to virtualize the screen, right? So I usually play a, a, a video from this company in France that's building this uh, HoloLens app. And they show how they're going to augment the, the old-style TV, your physical TV, like this. Uh, and then you're going to be able to virtualize the screens and move the screens around the room and do a, a whole bunch of other things. I usually explain how it works. Um, this is from Google's uh, announcement a week ago, where they're showing indoor mapping with the Tango sensor. And they're starting to hint at a new kind of slam map. Over on the right, you can see where the camera is in the, in the uh, hardware store. And it, I think the whole world is going to work like this soon. My speech is usually called the next two clicks of Moore's Law because the founder of Pixar told me a story um, that in the 60s, he knew that a digital film was possible, but he had to wait for Moore's Law to click, to flip over something like 20 times before Toy Story po popped out. He actually explained also that they had a movie before Toy Story, but it was one click too early. It just was too early. And he said every time we clicked Moore's Law off at the, at the end, uh, Steve Jobs took equity away from the, from the founding team. And that's why Steve's uh, wife now owns a good chunk of Disney. 
I talk about uh, sp how sports and how, th how things are going to change because of mixed reality, right? Uh, the PGA Tour is building already a HoloLens app. They already have a 3D scan of every, every hole on their course. They already are getting rid of humans to do the scoring. They have a scoring system that's, that sees the ball on the course um, with sensors. And they're building a HoloLens app so you can see the actual position of the course and the scoring system as it's happening. And they're uh, working with uh, companies like Lytro and 8i to put volumetric cameras around the hole. So you're going to actually be able to be on, let's say, hole 13 at the Masters and say, hey, show me a hole 17. I just heard a, squ uh, a cheer from hole 17. And you're going to be able to see what just happened on hole 17 in volumetric and walk around it. I asked the guy who started 8i, 8i is a, a volumetric camera company that builds 50 cameras around you and builds a point cloud of the actor that's in it. I think I actually have a, a video about that um, here. All right, so we'll stop that. Um, I don't need to play this stuff for you guys. But uh, I asked a, uh, the guy who runs 8i, when am I gonna be able to watch football on my kitchen table and walk around the kitchen table with mixed reality glasses on? And he says four years. So that's how I got the theme of this talk. That in the next two clicks to Moore's Law, the next four years, we're going to see some amazing things. Now, since you're the industry, and I'm usually representing you when I give speeches like this, um, I usually I, 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 I meet with people after the speeches and talk with them. And I keep hearing some common things that are wrong with uh, mixed reality so far. That's keeping us all from wearing them. I, I see very few HoloLenses on us. The first one is the weight. And I believe that in the next uh, year, we're going to see several glasses that are in the four ounce or less uh, uh, weight range. The HoloLens, I think, is 22 ounces, if I remember right. So it's way heavy. I can't wear that for more than an hour before my face starts hurting, and I certainly can't walk with it because it just bangs into my nose and, and all that. I'm going to take a picture, by the way. <laughs> this is something that's happened in the last two clicks of Moore's Law. Two, four years ago, I was playing with 360 cameras, and my uh, 360 cameras cost $6,000 back then. Now they're $200. And by the way, look at the uh, image stabilization on this thing. It's just nuts. So $200 from China. Insta 360, and there's a whole bunch of them. Soon we're going to have cameras that see depth as well as see a ball of pixels. And uh, that's probably going to come in the next 12 months. Um, Action Graham is. Yeah, I'm going to skip that. I usually show what it's like to have the aliens coming out of the walls. And of course, people who don't have their heads in VR or AR don't have any clue clue how cool this is, right? <laughs> it's true. My message usually to other audiences is you better get some VR in your company so that you start thinking about how to build things in, vo in volumetric, that you start understanding what immersion is and understanding why this is all important, what this industry is doing. Um, and understand the usage model and the interfaces that you're going to have to build to build a, a car of the future or a hotel of the future or whatnot. The other thing that I keep hearing is the viewing angle. The HoloLens has a viewing angle of about 20 degrees per eye. It's about this much. So we're about to build a new augmented copy of the world. That's what, that's what we're building, right? Right? Does anybody disagree with that? We're going to image every surface of the world and make a copy of it. People ask me, how do, I, how do I know what reality is? Well, reality is the analog wave that's coming off the stage and off of you right now. But soon, I'm going to be able to look at the augment. Right? We don't have it yet. We know it's coming. We know Microsoft's working on it. Uber's working on it. Mercedes, the CEO of Mercedes told me he's working on one because that's how the self-driving car is going to navigate is by having an image of the street at depth, at some resolution. Mercedes says it's two centimeters per voxel or volumetric pixel. 
volumetric pixels like a 3D pixel. And um, we're soon going to have that copy of the world to look at, but the viewing angle is a little narrow at the moment. So if I did have a copy of the world that I wanted to look at, or those aliens coming out of the wall, I can only see them in this little viewport, which I assume is going to get better, thanks to Avigant and others. One of the other concerns is eye strain. I keep hearing uh, people saying, oh, I played with HoloLens for a couple hours, and I got strained eye. And that's probably true. You just saw some of the optics that Avigant's doing that have multiple focal points so that your eye doesn't have to work against the real world to focus on an image that's you know, like that TV. Um, we're, I'm hearing rumors of much better field of view. We'll see how much better field of view. The industry keeps telling me that we're going to get about 15 degrees more field of view every time Moore's Law clicks. So every year and a half, we might beat that at the beginnings, right? Because we're seeing big improvements in optics. And Avagon's one, Magic Leap is another. I'm seeing another one on Friday here. So we'll see how that world works. Um, I usually show off the Loomis lenses. So those of you who haven't seen Loomis, it's an optics company from Israel. Uh, the blue one is. Uh, Loomis lens, there's a 720p monitor in those glasses. That's why I know this is coming, because it's been shown to me already. Right? This was at CES this year in January, and we're going to see several glasses with Loomis and with Avigant, with other lenses in, in the product. Um, they're sitting right next to a snap glass that doesn't have a screen, so it gives you a sense of the size of the projector and of the computer and a little bit of the battery that's in the back. And they last a few hours, because uh, the projectors are really efficient, and the lenses on these are really efficient compared to a, a smartphone screen. In September, you're going to get a new iPhone with an OLED screen. It uses 85% less battery than the current iPhone screen. So one of the key things about the iPhone that's coming out should be the battery lasts three days or something like that maybe longer. In the glasses, you get even more. People don't understand that when we start shrinking the silicon and shrinking these things down, we're getting really good efficiencies on these things. And they're getting better, right? Uh, Loomis, uh, I'm sorry, Copen showed me uh, projectors that last eight hours that are sharper and better than the Google Glass was three years ago, which only lasted 45 minutes. I usually talk about how user interface is about to change. I think there's a design renaissance going, uh, undergoing, and you're seeing it here at the, at the show uh, with many talks about design. But we get virtualized design now. Everything's going to be virtualized, right? When I do this in the future, why am I looking at a small little stupid screen? No, my whole screen should be here, right? And somebody has to design that, what it does. Uh, Jim Margraf, I think I talked with him. Uh, so I, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, here I usually uh, run this video, and it shows how VR is inside AR, right? This, Hi, uh, it's Paul. I'm here with the Hollow Herald. Uh, this guy yeah, built they, a door that you can walk in, and when you walk through the door, then you see only virtual pixels. Now, the optics aren't there, and we can argue about whether that's true VR or whether it's immersive when it's in a little viewing area. Fair enough. But within a few clicks of Moore's Law, we're going to get optics that do VR and AR and do them pretty damn well. And the room is going to be measured, is going to be mapped out. So this stage has a play area right here, and a blue line can be on the on the play area. And I walk into the play area, and now I'm in VR. Right? And it's protecting me from all the other stuff in the room. So I'm going to place it. I show how. Already, Euphoria and others are putting virtual things on top of everything. I mean, I saw this back in 2011 at Mattia, where they put monsters on skyscrapers outside. It's just we didn't have good enough cameras and good enough GPUs and all that. I talk about how uh, your industry, this industry is helping people work in a new way, how we're educating each other in a new way. We're using this already at Caterpillar to teach people how to fix a million dollar tractor. Or at Boeing, there's hundreds of people who have hollow lenses who are learning how to 
do the wiring harnesses in your plane. And there shouldn't be a mistake, otherwise one of those might fall out of the sky, right? That would be a bad day for Boeing. So we're using this in a new way to work and a new way to educate people. And it's a much better education technology than a book or a, a flat monitor. Um, I've run through some of these videos, talk about how work is already changing because we can virtually do things. Disney's new theme park in Shanghai, China was built in VR. And the guy who ran uh, ride design there said, we would walk through all the stakeholders in VR. We wouldn't build a physical model anymore, which was expensive. It's a lot cheaper to build things that are virtualized. And it's a lot cheaper to call people in who are virtualized to assist in this. When you're in a Skype call like this guy is uh, in, in you, uh, a volumetric Skype call, it's very different to be in that Skype call than being in the same Skype call on a 2D monitor. And you guys talk about that. Um, I talk about uh, where the, the future of interaction design is going. We, uh, Shell and I interviewed uh, Jim Margraf uh, a year ago. He runs a company called iFluence. He's putting eye sensors in the AR glasses. And he asked me, he, he didn't let me film the whole demo. You, you'll see the, the demo in a second. But he asked me to pull out a, a stuff out of my pocket. And I looked at my iPhone, and a menu popped off my iPhone 6S Plus when I looked at it. And it accurately knew it was a 6S Plus thanks to the AI that's coming along. In fact, who's doing the blind app? There was somebody. Is that team here? Yeah. These guys are cool. Their HoloLens app lets you walk around, a, a, map out a room, and then it tells you everything in that room, right? Cup of coffee, people sitting at table, and it navigates you around that room because it knows everything in that room, and it knows it in 3D, and it can tell me uh, with audio where, where to go, or it can give me big visual hints that a, 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 a not a totally blind person, but somebody who's visually impaired can use to see things, right? So let's just watch Jim, because I, I think Jim is awesome. He's building, look at this, at this uh, monitor as he uses his eyes. You're getting three things with eye sensors like this. You get biometric, because it knows it's him wearing the glasses. It gets you a new kind of interaction model. He's building a new operating system at Google now that's going to be for this mixed reality world. And you get foveated rendering so that our small little GPUs that are underpowered can flip Moore's Law twice, uh, according to the people who are building it. So let's watch that. If I want to, I can change pages. Here's another uh, um, a close-up of uh, uh, some electronics in our office. And I can go home when I want to. Over here is a medical application. and um, I'm gonna All with your them. eyes. All with my eyes. So I'm doing this solely with my eyes as fast as I can look. I'm not waiting. I'm not winking. I'm just looking. And here I've got uh, um, the patient. I've got some allergy record and protocols, insurance, confidential information, current conditions. Why is he here? Well, he tells me he's got a pain in his foot. Notice I'm looking at this, but there's nothing happening on the screen. But when I decide, for instance, that I want to check out his x-ray, there it is. And now I want to go back because a couple screens ago there was some confidential information, which is here. And um, now it's going to take a picture of my eye. It grabs it, says, oh, who is that? Confirms that it's me. And in a moment, you'll see that it'll give me access. I'm Jim, head of uh, CEO and founder of, of iFluence. And there it is. I've got confidential information. When I want to, I can return home as fast as that. That's amazing. All in my eyes. That's amazing. So I, I mostly wanted just to say thank you to this industry for making my life really crazy over the last few years. And it's about to get really crazy for the world. And it's this room building it. So thank you very much. Let's go on this next journey of the next four years and see some amazing things together. So thank you very much.